Hello, everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank David for including me in today. Um, well, I'm just as nervous as you are. <laughs> um, so, as you know, I'm Helen and um, I'm a neurophysiotherapist. Um, so, I'm a clinician by background. Um, I'm the co founder of Hobbs Rehabilitation and uh, um, one of the founders of the Mint Academy. So, Hobbs um, Rehab was founded in 2005. And it's one of the largest providers of independent interdisciplinary neurological rehab in the UK. Um, we provide a range of services from intense residential rehab through to outpatients and community, offering our patients a seamless service. We also um, do postgraduate clinical education, take students, and we work with universities in collaboration and research on projects. Um, and we're also um, early adopters of neurotechnology, which we embed into clinical practice alongside traditional therapy. Um, so we not only work with clinical networks, but we also work with tech industry, academia and research institutes, both in the UK and worldwide. We have a close working relationship with the NHS, and it's through this extensive network of relationships that we have developed the Mint Academy. Sorry, can you hear me? Um, so we, we've this close working relationship, um, and it. Sorry. It's through this close working network of relationships and through the Mint Academy that we've influenced the design of technology and its adoption into clinical practice. So Mint, you may ask what Mint is. Um, the Mint stands for Masterclass in Neurotechnology and it's a clinical research development practice, a clinical education flat platform. Mint evolved out of the recognition, the need to um, address the disconnect between device developers and research and the clinicians, where we identified there was a large gap. The clinical education delivered through the Mint Academy empowers the therapist to use the technology as part of an intensive rehab programme to drive neuroplasticity through a process of clinical reasoning, education, research and the product development. We run clinical consultancy days with industry, which so here are some of the projects that some of you are developing. I thought there may be some potential collaboration there. Um, but we include patients and specialist therapists, and this ensures a patient-centered design approach to any clinical product being developed. We run feasibility studies, we develop clinical protocols, and run multiple site research clinical trials. The Mint Academy educational platform is designed across five levels. From the science behind its use to the application into clinical practice, we also develop the MIT logbook to collect and record clinical data and patients' responses to intervention and the clinical outcomes. So we launched MIT officially at Rehab Week. I don't know if any of you have heard of that conference, but um, in Rotterdam in 2022, and we now have active projects with companies across the globe and clinical partners, I should add. They're not all companies, some of them are clinical partners working to collaborate to produce education. So when David asked me to talk today, I wasn't sure what my topic was going to be, but this is a very shortened version of a presentation that we did at the World Conference of Neuro Rehab. Um, it's in <coughs> recognition of something that we know is a global problem and we're trying to help find a solution so in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to try and present that solution to you. Um, but in order to find a solution, we need a really clear understanding of the problem. And I'm trying to stick to my script because I have a habit of going off on tangents, which means I won't get it done in the 15 minutes. So I apologize if I appear to be reading a bit. Okay, so data. Everyone's collecting it. It's come up in lots of conversations today. We're all protecting it and it can have monetary value. It's the foundation for AI, but it also needs to be useful and meaningful if it's actually going to serve a purpose. We need to look at why we're collecting it and what we are actually collecting. 
So within healthcare, there are multiple different types of data sets. I'm going to focus on clinical data. What we want to know as clinicians, what are the data that shows us patient outcomes, diagnostic and prognostic indicators, effective treatments, data that guides future research and informs treatment guidelines. For data to have meaning and purpose, it must be shared, transparent, and actually connected. I'm going to explain a little bit of why in rehabilitation this is particularly a particular challenge, and in an ever-emerging, growing technology healthcare market, this challenge for clinicians is getting even greater, and collecting that data is getting harder. Okay, so the process of rehabilitation is complex. It needed, needs um, to be delivered from multiple conditions, and it's also delivered across multiple locations. The type and intensity of rehab required is different at every single stage of recovery. The funding streams are complex, and they differ within the same country, within across regions, and worldwide. And sometimes there's just simply no funding allocated for rehab. Investment in rehabilitation saves money in long-term care costs. We need better long-term planning and joined up thinking over the whole patient journey. We need to collect the right data to demonstrate long-term benefits and cost savings by delivering the right rehabilitation at the right time and importantly to the right patients. Not only are the systems of and structures of rehab complex, but so are those who need it. Anything can happen to anyone at any time. We're all different. We all do and enjoy different things in our lives. And every injury is completely unique. And any injury will affect each one of us differently. Life consists of multiple facets. With an injury, but an injury or an illness will impact on all these areas of our lives. And this needs to be reflected both the assessment and the delivery of rehabilitation. The delivery needs to be recorded, measurable and reflect meaningful change to individual. The assessment in the rehabilitation process is delivered by a multidisciplinary team, all with a different focus but all working towards the same end goal, the best outcome for our patients, the maximum independence and the best quality of life possible for that individual. Each profession will assess, treat, and measure, and record their own findings. But the big question is, how are these findings recorded, measured, and how are they actually linked to each other? I'm going to say, very minimally. <laughs> so the International Classification of Functioning and Disability, or well, Health, or otherwise known as the ICF, is developed by the World Health Organization. And it's a framework used for describing and organising information on function and disability. Using the ICF for documenting a patient's status allows a common language, provides a scientific platform for understanding and studying health-related outcomes. It also provides a systematic coding scheme. And importantly, the functioning of a patient and their participation in daily life can be described. It shifts the focus from health condition to functioning. For example, someone with above knee amputation could be competing in the Paralympics running 100 metres, would be under 10 seconds. Or for someone else, it might mean the difficulty of getting on and off the toilet. They are the same diagnosis, but have completely different levels of function. And in the same way, somebody who can't walk to the shops to buy a pint of milk, maybe for multiple different reasons, it may be because they have a mental health problem or they're scared to go outside and they're anxious. It may be because they've got an underlying cardiac or respiratory problem, or it may be because they've had a stroke and they can't walk that far. So multiple reasons that end up in the same disability. You can't label a disability through a diagnosis. And it's so important that we're shifting the measurement of disability from diagnosis into activity and participation. In this diagram, I've broken down the assessment process as a clinician might approach it. In this process, you can see at the top, um, we use the ICF framework um, to, to take information, detailed information from the patient, their medical history, their social and personal outline, 
as outlined by the ICF. As a therapist or a clinician, we then identify impairments, and these you can see on the left. For example, there's pain, loss of movement, muscle weakness, and multiple other things, loss of sensation. Um, and then we had those impairments, we break down and we actually measure them. Um, and from that, the therapist treating the patients will formulate, I should say the MDTT treating the patients, will formulate a treatment plan by dividing the functional activities into several areas. We can then go into goal setting, which is done with the patient. The process is then linked to clinical outcome measures. The therapist record these and use them, and there's a range of these over here on the right. Um, all of these are different data sets. Clinicians record impairment measures, measures, levels of functional activity, patient goals, clinical outcomes, and functional measurement scales. In addition, we record individual treatments and the impact those treatments have on the patient. So this can include medicine or medical or surgical intervention, changes in medication, hands-on therapy, exercise, task practice, and the use of an ever-increasing range of technologies, some of which we've all talked about today. All of those could be used on one particular patient. The assessment and treatment process identified at least four different data sets. The challenge is not only to record and collect this data, but also to find a way to link them so it's relevant and meaningful. And I'm going to try and present this a little bit further and illustrate it with a patient case study. Um, I haven't got an older person in this, but it applies equally to the patient case study. So the, the concept is exactly the same. Okay, so this is Nathan. Nathan is a 38-year-old elite athlete. In addition to competing, Nathan, Nathan's job and business was he ran a triathlon coaching business called NFT. So Nathan had a bicycle accident um, while he was competing, and he sustained a mild head injury and a high incomplete spinal cord injury. And after his initial acute care, including surgery, he made good progress. Eight or nine months after his injury, Nathan joined Hobbs and he was able to take a few steps with a friend. But his injury had not just impacted on his mobility, it had impacted on all areas of his life. So we used the ICF framework to group his problems into impairments, activities, particip participation restrictions. Mobility is one of Nathan's most important goals, and I will say this is still ongoing for him. His progress from being able to walk with a frame to walking with no aid inside and outdoors with a crutch. And he was even able to walk his dog, which was one of his really important goals to him. He's able to tackle stairs and he's able to get in and out of his car so he's able to access his community. <clears throat> These are some photos that were taken throughout Nathan's rehab journey. We often use him as a case study because so, he's very happy for us to, and he's a brilliant um, example. Um, so some of the treatments target his mobility, and others addressed his upper limb hand function. I hope you can see this illustrates the range of different treatments, including technologies that were used during Nathan's rehab journey. This illustrates the four data sets we collected for Nathan. This isn't all of them, but the most I can put in the slides. Um, you will see the therapy included the use of multiple devices. An important thing here is to note that currently each manufacturer uses a different software platform. We need to find, so as a therapist, you could imagine that eight or nine different platforms that we're recording the devices on. We need to find a patient-centered solution that link these four data sets together to understand the impact of our intervention on our patient's outcomes. So what is the solution? Any ideas? <laughs> Part of it, David. <laughs> okay, so let me introduce you to Abilitate. So the ICF is used by many professionals across the world. And the initial assessment is structured on the ICF categories, activities, environmental factors, function, and structures. So let me introduce you to the Abilitate app. So the Abilitate app has been developed by a company working with Hobbs in Austria. 
they're called Texas people. And they have worked to develop a solution in which this, this documentation is now on an app using the ICF co uh, codes is now possible. So Hobbs and Texas people have been working on this together. They have had the, done a lot of the coding and we have been trialing it in clinical practice, advising them on changes to make the app more user friendly. The Ability app provides a platform that documents the therapy using the ICF categories <coughs> and codes, and this is also integrated with patient goals and outcome. The Ability is fully GDPR compliant, patient data anonymized, and hosted in the EU, currently working on MDR and FDA approval. So, the MIDLOC book, which I mentioned at the beginning, which is the recording of the use of clinical um, technology in clinical practice. So, the MIDLOC book, originally designed as part of the MIDLOC educational platform, collects the data that clinicians record in, during the intervention while using the technology. Screens take the user through a process of reflection, not only on a device, how a device was used, but what modifications the clinician needed to make to make the device work to be meaningful to the patient's treatment session. And really importantly, it looks into whether or not the technology used was successful in working specifically towards the ICF um, impairments and goals of that patient. So we're working with tech people and our colleagues to combine the Abilitator and the mid -block into a single patient-centered software platform. The working name for this, which is not probably going to last, <laughs> is temporarily a <laughs> Um I'm not sure it's going to be the everlasting name, but it seems to work for us at the moment. Mintable. <laughs> We've looked that up already. Um, I was taking, um, that's already been taken. Oh. A billion minutes. A billion minutes. Welcome to suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> so machine data without context is worthless. We actually need to know who, what, when, why, and how the intervention that was when the patient was using the machine, what happened. So we're now in the process of our next steps of development. So we've divided, I'm going to divide this into three stages. And stage one is the ability which is the combining of the Abilitate app and the Mint Logbook, creating a software platform for recording rehabilitation therapy data worldwide, centered around the patient. Stage two is the app learning from the data pool and linked to the technology device, data-driven building the foundations of AI. And stage three is the generative AI rehabilitation pathways. Currently, there are minimum guidelines or actually what we do when we rehabilitate patients. There is minimal evidence, and particularly when you start engaging with the use of technology in this process. So the machine learning. Our team of therapists and software developers are completing a scoring system, thereby laying the foundation for machine learning. The Abilimint app will collect and compare the data from countless therapy plans of patients with comparable challenges and therapists around the world. The app knows which therapy plan has resulted in the fastest progress for each patient, depending on their individual indication and abilities and impairments. So you linking the device use and rehabilitation back to the patient goals and the ICF framework, back to what I presented at the beginning. Gets even more exciting. So MIDAS. MIDAS stands for Manufacturers Independent Data Acquisition System. I mentioned on the case study that we use 10 different, at least 10 different technologies treating one patient. And every single one of those technology manufacturing companies has a different software platform. So by developing an independent platform for that data to be collected, it can be centered around the patient. We've got some initial manufacturers already on board who would like to have coming interested to use this, but we also want it to become an industry standard. And Hobbs is a member of ISART. I don't know if you've heard of ISART. Now, ISART is the International Industry Society for Assistive Robotic Technologies in Rehabilitation. Um, and one of the people we're working with is the new president of ISART coming in. Um, a single platform 
solves a major problem for therapists, as highlighted by the case study, linking the therapy data from different technologies with just one interface. The technology companies would still have the access to their data through the MIDAS platform, but it would have been recorded through clinical application by therapists who are actually working with patients. And that way it is unique. So combining the know-how, and say the best therapists in the world, uh, worldwide, using a billing mint, we can collect and compare data, generate the best therapy plans, improve patient outcomes, and save money. I hope I've presented a disruptive approach, a solution that will change the outcomes for patients through the delivery and informed rehabilitation landscape worldwide. This informed solution has been designed and driven by clinicians who have a passion for improving patient outcomes and have real life experience of treating patients using rehab technologies, getting frustrated through the use of rehab technology and the lack of guidelines. But this solution will empower them to deliver the right rehabilitation for the right patient at the right time. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that, um, Helen. Do we have any any questions of Helen? I'm I'm going to bring in uh, Steve Gardner now. Um, he's uh, in the states at the moment, but uh, he's going to be the next speaker. Um, so, uh, Steve.